warning. This show features dark subjects which may be triggering to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Chaos Jaw. I am Frederick, a gentleman fish here in place of J. West Seacord, who has gone to the beach with Reginald. And next to me is the host of the show and the big bag of fags, Bad Ben. Hey. And as always, we are joined by Wally AJ. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Apparently, Wally AJ is a two-headed creature that we're yeah, unsure of which head is what. Well, then. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so is there, yep. th- there's more house cleaning to be done. Oh, <laughs> yes! If you would like to follow us on Twitter and Instagram, you can do so at K... Uh, which one is it? Chaos Jar. At B.A. Chaos Jar. At B.A. Chaos Jar. But you can also follow J. West Secord on his Twitter at I'm glad you asked underscore. It's like an ellipsis, you see. And he would love you to ask him questions about any random thing. Feel free to do so. He's very lonely. He's very lonely. Anyway, <laughs> you can also follow us. <laughs> you can also follow us on our Facebook at Chaos Jaw Podcast. But that is not it. It is also the name of our YouTube channel. For people who don't understand what podcasts are, they can just listen to the audio on a YouTube. I'm a fish. (laughs) (laughs) And if you would like to give us some money, because gentlemen pay gentlemen money, you can go to... you can go to patreon.com slash chaos jar and throw us a couple of bucks where we or ducats as we call it in our hometown on clipperton island uh yes we still use ducats on clipperton island (laughs) (laughs) and if doing so, we will give shout outs. You'll become an executive producer and some other third thing. Oh, yes, you'll get early access to the bonus episode, The Overflow. All this in the show notes and more. Not actually more, I hear. Well, <laughs> Ben. Yes. According to the the cue card I have, it says to ask you what's going in the jar today. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the dolphin point experiment, Frederick. <laughs> I love dolphin penis. <laughs> I meant dolphin. His name was, I do know a dolphin named Dalton. Dalton. <laughs> Dalton the dolphin. <laughs> you, he, him and I had a quite the love affair. <laughs> what I love is that this has this entire experiment has to do with talking animals and we have talking animals. <laughs> oh really? Yep. Where? <laughs> Are you a fish? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he fails to see the correlation. I'll just I'll leave the math to you on that one, bud. <laughs> okay, so um, let's begin with some context in teaching animals to talk. Um, animals have been able to communicate like complexly, just like humans can. Uh, we invented language, but they use certain cues and so on. And I'm sure they have languages as well. I'm unsure what fish language is, but... <laughs> uh, I speak English. <laughs> we invented of... that in the in the 18th century. Holy 
crud. <laughs> so, um, so for the past 200 years, researchers have reported several instances where non-human animals demonstrated remarkable language-like capabilities. Um, we're going to start off with a really famous example that was a hoax called uh, the hor- It was a horse named Clever Hans. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Hans sounds like a Swedish name. <laughs> so Hans was apparently <laughs> able to respond to simple arithmetic calculations with accuracy. So when asked what's two plus two, he would tap his hoof four times. It really amazed the public and a lot of psychologists started coming to take a look and see why this animal was performing this way. And he was even written about in the New York Times in 1904. Probably just turned out that horses naturally count. (laughs) And understand English numbers? Fish do! (laughs) We figured that out in the 18th century. Historical facts. Historical facts. Hundred (laughs) percent. All right. (laughs) Whatever the education system is on Clipperton Island. Trust me, with fish, there's always a school. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, there was a group of 13 people called the Hans Commission who investigated the claims. And the the group included a veterinarian, a circus manager, a cavalry officer, a number of school teachers, and the director of the Berlin Zoological Gardens. And they came to the conclusion that what was happening was that Hans has a Hans's handler would give him cues of how many times he needed to tap his foot instead of him actually understanding what human language was or what the mathematical equation was. Oh, so it turns out he was just a well-trained horse. Yes. We call those stupid. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> okay. They're very similar to seahorses. Did you know the male ones are the ones that hold the babies? It's like oh. second grade, my guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of hopes that we would be able to teach animals to actually speak human language. However, scientists have actually come to the conclusion that most animals don't have the right physical tools to be able to do that. They don't have a flexible larynx, um, or they don't have certain capabilities with the synapses of their brain, or their vocal cords just don't possibly move in that way. Um, to be fair, most people don't comprehend the English language either. That is very true. <laughs> I've known quite a few people that way. They drowned. <laughs> um, scientists have actually focused in on... <laughs> Oh, that was dark. (laughs) Wow. It's almost like that's the kind of show it is. I try to do do a fun episode and all of a sudden... (laughs) Uh, So anyways... um, The Mexican police are still after me. (laughs) (laughs) Is one the (laughs) Mexican-Canadian? Or is he busy building the cage? (laughs) If I remember correctly, he was just the announcing guy. They like to use him because he's so clear in talking. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Okay. (laughs) Fucking hell. All right. Oh, he changes water. So, um... They did think that chimps had the ability to do it because they do have flexible larynxes, they have lips, they have vocal tracts, um, but their brains just can't figure that out. They can figure out sign language, but they're not able to figure out complex words and being able on how to be able to say them. So that's to come out. However, there is still these myths based around the fact that parrots can mim- mimic us. Um, parrots are the best at producing human like english and they have thick they have thick complex muscle muscular vocal tracts and flexible tongues 
but their brains only allow them to mimic things. They can't actually comprehend entirely what they're saying. So they'll understand that they can link that a sound will bring something over. Like, for instance, we have a parrot at home that um, it makes us uh, water, like a, a, the water bottle spray sound. And that's when she wants a bath and she'll make that sound. So she's understood that, but she's not actually understanding that the sound She's not able to understand the words we're saying to her. She's only able to comprehend those sounds back over and that it gets a reaction. Now, as a fish, I don't understand what birds are. <laughs> and, um... But, like birds aren't real. Right? <laughs> the birds aren't real. <laughs> but, uh, if I am correct, don't the birds known as crows also have some decent intelligence for such abilities? They do in a lot of ways. They are very clever, but um, theirs is still just mimicking. Hmm. Interesting. So I don't trust all human voices. Um. Okay. <laughs> Especially if it's in the middle of the woods at night, somewhere remote. Yes. A place that a fish would be. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> so On a school field trip. Century. <laughs> okay, so there was a there was a bunch of like really big trying to teach animals English projects that were happening, um, and one of them happened in 1971. It was called the Lana Project. <laughs> I saw your face for a second. <laughs> so uh, Dwayne Rumba and Erst von Glaserfeld. I believe it's pronounced Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> Or the rock. The rock. The only problem is he can only speak in third person. (laughs) Oh, I knew a couple of rocks who only spoke in third person. (laughs) You really shouldn't take that for granted. Get the fuck out of here. Uh, Uh, That's a crime of pebble cause. I'm sorry that I led you on. <laughs> Alright, time to go see if my toast is waterproof. I'll be back, please. <laughs> yeah, that's it. This is over. <laughs> <laughs> All we hear is... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to steal your joke. Yeah. God damn it. So, um, so, these two researchers at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center in Atlanta... Um, they led a team of scientists who made a computer-based language training system, and they brought in a female chimpanzee named Lana um, and taught her to use a keyboard. She actually did really, really well, and uh, she, with a lot of research, she was able to distinguish many of the terms and relate them to the symbol on the keyboard. Um, the lexigram that they used, uh, the lexigram that they used was basically just English uh, words or certain things that would play up on a video monitor and the speaker would also play the word to her when she pressed on the symbols. Oh, I think I've seen a similar thing on TikTok with cats and dogs. A little dog buttons on the floor? Yeah. Uh, this is, I think this is a little more complex than that, but okay. <laughs> yeah, but it's like the same thing, right? Yeah, very, very close. <laughs> Yes, basically the same thing. Of dollars of scientific dick research. It's just buttons on a floor. It's <laughs> they're, they're like, well, we spent all the money. What do we do now? Well, we'll just make some buttons and we'll put them on the floor and then she'll hit them and it'll make a sound and we'll pretend like she understands what's happening. <laughs> make the money back. I got the idea from a Staples commercial. Yeah. <laughs> That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> so, um, Lana could tell uh, a lab assistant that she had to do things like refill her treats. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> she could also request. <laughs> Uh, she could also request oh. items that weren't in the lab that she couldn't see, which told researchers that she'd formed an association with the object and the lexigram, and it stuck in her brain. Um, after over five years, she could eventually form sentences using her keyboard, like, Please, Tim, tickle Lana. 
Just ask for Cheetos. <laughs> uh, so millions of dollars of scientific research. Yeah, please, Tim, Chickalana. And to think, we fish learned how to talk in the 18th century. <laughs> you said you invented English in the 18th century. <laughs> yes, it's the exact same thing. <laughs> Uh, next was Coco the gorilla. She was just a year old in 1972 when she began to study human uh, language using sign language. She was born in San Francisco Zoo, and uh, two re- two Stanford researchers, Francine Patterson and Charles Pasternak, took her to a sanctuary near Woodside, California, in Santa Cruz Mountains, and uh, she was taught sign language. Um, Within just two weeks, she was able to sign, make the signs for water and food. Um, in the span of four years, she could do over 400, uh, 200 signs. And then um, they tested her comprehension, and she scored extremely well. Not like human well, but she could understand and do advanced understanding. So, for instance, one of the examples that is used is that she knew she was given a ring, and they tried to get her to sign what a ring would be to her. So what she did was she associated it with something you wear on your finger and she knew what the word bracelet was. So she would sign it as a finger bracelet. And that's how they knew her association was there, but not as complex as a human. She didn't make up another word for it. Um, Yeah. She actually became like extremely, extremely famous. Uh, she did, she knew over a thousand signs and was able to understand roughly two thousand words of spoken English. Um, and she did pass away years later, like I think in like two thousand five, something like that. That's a real shame. Sorry, she died in two thousand June of two thousand eighteen. She was forty six. That's a real shame. I would have liked to talk to her. Yeah. Um. A crazy thing about Coco that is amazing is that she really, really had a fascination with nipples, both male and female. Who doesn't? (laughs) Um, Robin Williams actually spent a lot of time with Coco, and she loved him. She would actually, like, crack up a lot with him. Because Uh, of his nipples. um, He actually (laughs) joked about the fact that um, Coco would hold him by his nipples. nipples. (laughs) (laughs) So, um... Yeah, in 2005, there was three female researchers who quit working with Coco and sued the Gorilla Foundation uh, where Coco was living due to sexual harassment by the gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> that is awful! <laughs> but I feel like an even worse animal is coming up. Uh, their lawsuits were settled out of court, but what I love about this is that uh, like three researchers just got together and were like, the gorilla was harassing us. Like, <laughs> uh, they well, said, but your job to train the gorilla, though. Like, yeah. Well, they said that they felt pressured to show Coco their nipples. Which, in all honesty, if I'm stuck with a gorilla, I might actually like just be like, well, <laughs> that ch- that motherfucker can kill you. Yeah. Life or death, like nipple or death situation. Yeah. It's a nipple or death situation. Hi, folks. Sager of the Editor here with a new editing tip. If you've asked your editor to remove a section of audio from your podcast, don't stay in character and do bits. I had to do some editing on this episode, so here's the quick version of what you missed. Recording in progress. Oh, shit. Sagriff? Sagriff. Sagriff. Dr. Tweeters. Sagriff. Yes. And now back to your regularly scheduled bottle of red wine. In 2015... The uh, BBC printed an article that only eight non-human animals can pass a mirror test, which the mirror test is used to see um, certain levels of being able to comprehend that you, like, being able to comprehend that you're not, like, it's like a consciousness thing. Like, actually knowing that you are an individual being. Um, Which animals were those? The animals were, number one was an Asian elephant, um, Eurasian magpies, bonobos. 
chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, manta rays, bottlenose dolphins, and like that's it. Like those are all eight. So and I find it fascinating that manta rays are on there, but even in the source material I have, manta rays are kind of uh they're not entirely certain if they have identified themselves or if it's just uh like it's kind of like a 50-50. It's also been proven that house cats can recognize themselves. Also um, there's the also a nice assholes. feature. Uh, I know it's the house cat. <laughs> they believe that ants can recognize themselves looking in a mirror, but I don't actually believe that. How the fuck could you test that? That's, That's exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so when they did the experiment... Does the ant go up to the mirror, press its hand, and then move it around to see if the other ant moves too? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, apparently when viewing other ants through glass, ants... This asshole won't get uh, out of my way. Ants didn't divert from their natural the mirror. normal behavior. Um, so, basically when they saw another identical looking ant, their behavior did change though, when they were put in front of a mirror. So if they're just looking at other ants through glass, and they didn't act differently, but when they had a mirror there, the ant acted differently. If I were to suggest a theory, I would believe that the ant, because ants probably use pheromones to, to recognize each other, saw an ant that it couldn't smell and was like, holy shit, who the fact is that? God, ants. Uh, so part of the- I said the other one was- was <laughs> in a glass though, right? Some, like so glass like, pheromone glass doesn't conduct pheromones, does it? But what about uncles? <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. I think he has a point. He made a good point there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um basically the ants would retreat and then reapproach the mirror, and sometimes they would even start grooming themselves in front of the mirror. So well, that's saying the ants are flexing on themselves. Yeah. Hell, I do that. You groom yourself in front of your mirror? Absolutely! I find like that everybody's more than you So, even with the point of this whole thing, um, <laughs> dolphins are one of the animals here, and that's why John Lilly decided to use dolphins in his experiment. Uh, it's, is this another roundabout way for me to once again, listen to how terrible dolphins are. That's what's about to happen. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, let's do this. Dolphins are the worst. I'm strapped in. So John Cunningham Lilly was born on January 6, 1915. And he was born to a wealthy family in St. Paul's, Minnesota. And right, his father was Richard Coyle Lilly. And he was the president of the First National Bank of St. Paul. His mother was Rachel Leonard Cunningham, and she owned Cunning. Uh, her family owned Cunningham and Haas Company, which is like a large stockyard in St. Paul. So they are extremely, extremely well off. Um, John had an older brother named Richard Lilly Jr. and a younger brother named David Mayer Lilly, and there was a fourth child named Mary Catherine Lilly, but she died in infancy. Catherine is. So far, the only normal middle name I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, John showed interest in science from a very early age. And at 13 years old, he actually became a chemistry hobbyist. Um, and he supplemented his uh, makeshift basement laboratory with chemicals that were given to him by a pharmacist friend. I love the Wait, idea. Wait, isn't this that... Breaking Bad? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds just like it. Um, students at his Catholic grade school called him Einstein Jr., <laughs> so at age 14 he enrolled at St. Paul's Academy um, which is a college preparatory school for boys and the teachers encouraged in the school laboratory from there on out so we moved on from the basement out of the closet <laughs> oh god <laughs> so he also started studying <laughs> philosophy don't touch me sorry <laughs> you have some weird tangles in your hair and I needed to get them out <laughs> I didn't realize fish were OCD. <laughs> Is there a nipple uh, It's just an there? erotic... <laughs> fish coming out of the closet. Yeah, the fish is coming out of the closet now. <laughs> so, Oh, I've been out of the closet, boys. <laughs> what a weird place to store your fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. 
Um, so also at um, the St. Paul's Academy, he studied philosophy. So I love the idea that he's studying science, but then he's also like, but why? <laughs> uh, so Richard, his dad, wanted him to go to Eastern an Eastern Ivy League university and become a banker. But instead, he got a scholarship to California Institute of Technology in Pasadena and studied biology. Yeah, I gotta control and my he life, also dad. became the guy. In, in, in fish what was school? that? School of Fish. <laughs> Never mind. Oh, I, the joke came full circle in my head. Oh, I see. <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> So, yes, I was part of the ski club and the theater club. In your fish school? Well, obviously. <laughs> God, at least, you know, Wally G, Wally AJ gets it. I would have called him Wally G. <laughs> Wally G. <laughs> Wally G. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's not even the weirdest thing I've been called today. <laughs> It is something you will be called forever now. <laughs> Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't believe you. <laughs> so um, after his first year there at Caltech, um, John Lilly was uh, canceled his scholarship because Caltech learned that he was from a wealthy family. So they were basically like, oh, your parents have money, so why are you on a scholarship? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good fucking The system point. works. That's a fair question. <laughs> so I love the fact that he like had to like my scholarship canceled now. So I gotta go back and tell my dad that I basically told the fuck off. Like I, I need his help. Like <laughs> oh so Please. fortunately his dad did help him and set him up with a trust fund to pay the tuition and then actually became a benefactor of the college itself. So his dad didn't even just be like, okay, I'll help you. And here's your tuition money. He was like, he bought the, the way, college. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to yeah. keep donating money to the college. And, uh, like, no college kicks my son out of school. <laughs> the only way to show them <laughs> is to pay them more money. Yeah. It's a very Tony Stark way of doing things, though, isn't it? Like, yeah. piss me off, you're mine now. <laughs> That's fine. I own you now. Yeah. <laughs> My dad's scholarship. <laughs> I'm trying to snap too. I love that you're failing at this. I don't know how your flippers would work for that. Exactly. That's the joke. <laughs> Actually, whales do snap. Wait, what? Whales well, can snap. To fucking... Inside their flippers, they actually have finger bends. And they yeah, will snap them to I mean, still doing what? Oh, so the audio keeps cutting in and out here and there. Uh, rip. What's okay? My dog keeps trying that, to play with her. I'm busy. That was a dog. <laughs> no, that one was a child of some kind. Did that on my end. Oh. Oh no, that was my cat. Oh yeah, oh, child of some kind. Same it thing. Was a cat. That is what I heard. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. So basically, John's dad would actually help him financially for the rest of his life. Like. Even when he was accomplishing things later, his dad was still like, here's some money, son. Damn, <laughs> get a job, man. Like, what are you doing? Here's some money, son. Go buy he can't a get a job. He's got a philosophy degree. Oh, right, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Get a job, son, but why? <laughs> <laughs> you may be a biologist, but you immediately lose everything by being a philosopher. Oh, wow. Exactly. So, <laughs> um, do anything with a liberal arts Lily degree. eventually read um, "Brave New World" by Aldous. Yeah, Aldous Huxley. I don't I've know. heard of it. <laughs> this is all a brave. Thanks <laughs> 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 for nerds. Uh, so, um, just to set it up, though, it's a fictional dystopia, and it portrays um, the government, like government control over people basically through any development. So reproductive technology, sleep leaning, psychological manipulation and classical conditioning. So in it, the like main protagonist is basically, um, I don't even know if he's the protagonist. He is, well, he would be, I guess, but it follows um, a man who discovered that he had a son 
via a non-government form of reproduction and they try to like civilize him. Oh, interesting. We have a very similar uh, tale in the fish world. Oh no. Is it called Brave New Sea? No, it's called Finding Nemo. God damn it. <laughs> it's like we're all on the train track. And we have saw you, the train coming. And nobody moved out of the way. No way to get out of the fucking train track. <laughs> oh my god. We're all just like, man, that train's getting real. <laughs> oh god. So um, this this re- reading this book made uh, like inspired Lily to give up on studying physics and continue studying biology and just concentrate entirely on neurophysiology. So he just wanted to like, from this, he just took away that I should really study how the nervous system works in a person. Um, which is very, very odd. Like, yes, I don't fully understand the nervous system as a fish. I don't feel pain. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Lucky you. <laughs> My head hurts. Also, no, no, that is true, man. Uh, fish don't they have like danger pain. sensors, but like no actual ability to feel pain. Okay. <laughs> yes. It's weird. So, um, while he was a ju- while he was a junior at Caltech, he got engaged to a Mary Crouch. Uh, months before their wedding, he came down with a bout of what's called, quote, nervous exhaustion. Um, And he decided to take a random job with a lumber company in the Northwest. So he essentially was like, okay. (laughs) How Dexter ended? How the fuck does this guy get to dolphins? It's a long story. (laughs) I'm The dolphins were hiding in the woods, obviously. (laughs) Yeah, the dog looking for the fish that were in the woods. <laughs> this is why us fish never go into the woods. <laughs> so, um, during this sabbatical, he was also hospitalized for badly injuring his foot with an axe while cutting away in the brush. So we can't do <laughs> anything right. All right. Um, so his time in the trauma ward inspired him to become a medical doctor. Oh my god. <laughs> This so, is one, it's been one of those professional <laughs> students I hear about. So in 1937, his, John's father arranged a meeting between John and uh, Charles Horace Mayo, who is the one who, fam- who famously made the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And also Mayo Nays. <laughs> I don't think I don't that think... would help <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was Joseph Miracle Whip. <laughs> Uh, that isn't mer. That's not mayonnaise. That is Miracle Whip. It has a zangy tip. It's too spicy. Helped him getting to the Dartmouth Medical School in Hanover, New Hampshire. He graduated from Caltech with a Bachelor of Science degree in 1938, and then enrolled in Dartmouth. And uh, from there, he became a really close friend with the son of Charles Mayo, Charles William Mayo. I love when people name their kids after themselves. Like me too. All the juniors. In yeah. fact, I'm Frederick the 84th. <laughs> In fact, there's been four generations of Fredericks on the show. Fish don't live long. <laughs> so lily launched into a study of anatomy and performed dissections on 32 cadavers and then he once stretched entire uh, intestinal tract across the length of a room to determine its actual length i I'm fascinated by this man. Just He's done some shit, huh? Yeah. So um, during the summer of his first year with his former Caltech biochemistry teacher. Oh, God. This is you got bad. this. I believe in um, the hilarity of what you're about to say. Yeah. So the study was in the creation of gly- glyco- glycosamine. 
which is a major source of muscle power in the human body. And for their subject, they use John Lilly as the for the subject of the experiment. Um, it put Lilly in a completely protein-free diet while administering measures doses of glycine and arginine, um, which are two amino acids that were hypothesized to create glyco glycosiamine. The experiments pushed Lilly to an extreme physical and mental limit, and he became increasingly weak and delirious as the experiment just kept going on for weeks. So I love that they're just... Yeah, starving yourself will do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, the result of the experiment confirmed the hypothesis, and Lilly's name was included among the authors of the paper that was published. And this would be the first published paper of his career. So... During World War II, Lilly worked for the U.S. military and researched the physiology of high-altitude flying and invented instruments as well. Jesus Christ! Like, after the war, Lilly decided that he wanted to pursue a career in, the med uh, in medical research rather than therapeutic practice, as was standard for Dartmouth medical students. So he transferred to the University of Pennsylvania, um, which would provide a better opportunities for conducting research. There, he met a bunch of more like-minded people. Um, he met Professor H. Cuthbert Bazette, who and uh, a British protege, a, a protege of British physiologist J. B. S. Haldane. Uh, Bazette introduced Lily to Haldane's view that scientists should never conduct an experiment or procedure on another person that they have not first conducted on themselves. And this would literally haunt him for the rest of his life. Like he would do this every time. He would participate if he was going to do an experiment he, or any kind of sort of procedure, he would undergo it himself as well. Now that's dedication. <laughs> so um, that's foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Lily also created one of his first full inventions, which was an electrical cap uh, capacitance. Diaphragm manometer is a device used for measuring blood pressure. Do you need help with those words? Oh my God, this is getting bad. <laughs> <laughs> so biophysic pioneer Britain Chance. And Chance also introduced Lily to the world of computers, which was still just starting to come up. Um, while finishing his degree at the University of Pennsylvania, Lily also enrolled in a class entitled How to Build an Atomic Bomb. And they took uh, notes in the class and and they, and they transcribed it into a book with the same title. And they actually were like linked to the director of the Manhattan Project's General Leslie Groves. And attempted to, um, but Groves decided to suppress the publication um, and was unable to because there was no classified data in the book. So Groves is like, we don't want people knowing about this stuff, but they're like, we didn't use anything that was classified. So he couldn't get rid of this <laughs> so lily graduated with a medical degree from the university of pennsylvania in 1942 and he began his career as a conventionalist scientist uh, doing research for universities and the government in 1951 he published a paper showing how he could display patterns of brain electrical activity on a cathode ray display screen using electrodes he devised specifically for insertion into a would start to go into more unconventional topics. In 1952, neuro, uh, uh, in 1952, John Lilly accepted a position at the head of, head of section of cortical integration at the National Institution for, of Mental Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And in 1954, um, he had an aim he had an experiment that was aimed at isolating a brain from external stimulation and devised the first isolation tank, a dark soundproof tank of salt of warm salt water which the subject could float for long periods in sensory isolation. So he designed sensory deprivation tanks. I want to try one of those so bad. I know. It's, um, it's not so cool when you're a fish. Lily actually Damn. became like completely obsessed with this thing like he would spend hours of his day in this thing just coming up with ideas and it really messed with them especially because Lee, um we're at the point in his life where he begins to um 
experiment with send into madness it's gonna be even worse it's gonna be it's yeah hulu no so <laughs> that the belly finds an economic teaches it how to build an atomic bomb <laughs> <laughs> next thing you know <laughs> <laughs> teaches the Necronomicon to build a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we should What could go wrong? <laughs> it's fine. We're good. It's okay. We're fine. Right. It's fine. So um, he discovered a prevailing hypothesis that a lack of stimulation would cause a person to fall asleep. But he discovered that this was wrong. <clears throat> so he discovered a psych- uh, psychedelic state that he described as, quote, a doorway into the universe that allowed one to escape its body, one's soul can leave, and one can clean one's karma and from one's soul and become a pure spirit, end quote. So he, did, he did shrooms. That's what he did. Uh, he, he actually gets into, oh, like... into something different. <clears throat> so huh. he begins to develop an interest in psychedelics, and... <laughs> there it is. Yeah, this actually brings him to really like to use LSD. <laughs> Have some old mo- to 600 tiny sections of hypodermic tubing into the skulls of monkeys, through which he would insert electrodes into different parts of the monkey's brain and electrically stimulate each part of the brain to determine what part of the brain was responsible for pleasure, anger, anxiety, pain, fear. Basically, he tortured these poor little monkeys. I love the idea of pounding 600 hypodermic needles. Like, he's just there being like, get in there. Like, <laughs> I'm very glad Bernard isn't here. He'd be we're, out of, we're out of room. Put another one. Yes. He even figured out exactly. I wonder if there were just, like, no mirrors in that room so that he couldn't <laughs> see himself doing this and then think, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> I love the idea that he was probably in that sensory deprivation tank and then was like, you know what I should do? I should <laughs> stab a monkey in the skull. <laughs> 600 times. <laughs> Man, so he, figured out he was jacked. What, what part of the brain <laughs> was responsible for an orgasm and then gave that particular monkey access to a switch that controlled stimulate, uh, stimulating that particular electrode and found that the monkey would reward itself with near continuous orgasms at least uh, at least one every three minutes up to 16 hours Jesus. a day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, asking for a friend. <laughs> I, I'm asking for a friend. You know, Bernard. <laughs> Bernard. <laughs> uh, the rock ape. <laughs> So Lily also found out that when a monkey was given a switch to stimulate an electrode within the pleasure center of its brain, it would press the switch three uh, uh, the switch three hours per second for sixteen oh three times per second for sixteen hours a day. Three hours per second. That's yeah, a whole it's just the way theory. I wrote it. <laughs> three hours per second. <laughs> so this, well, this allows the monkey to flood shit. its own brain with endorphins to the point of addiction or trauma this monkey basically orgasmed to death i love that it gave itself trauma from so much pleasure trust me that can much happen a good thing. remember that story i was telling you about dalton <laughs> i wish that's where my trauma originated yeah <laughs> My tra- I need a therapist. Uh, I've had way too many orgasms. <laughs> <laughs> so where does your PTSD stem from? It, I would orgasm. And I pressed it every I off nonstop. Hours. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, dear. They call that your genitals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I can get up <laughs> three times a second for 16 hours with my own genitals, I'd be a freak of fucking science. <laughs> I would donate myself to be studied at that point. <laughs> like, yo, y'all, I can believe I bet this. you would, big boy. Watch this. <laughs> oh, my God. So he began to become interested in cestations um, since coming face-to-face with a beached pilot whale on the coast near his home in Massachusetts in 1949 when he was 34. Did he stimulate the whale, too? <laughs> no, he just began to imagine how intelligent the creature must have been because of the size of the animal's brain. Hold on. So, 
at the age of 34. So everything you've said has been before 34 years of age. So everything um, except for when he started working and doing this monkey experiment, because then he would have been, but he did all this before he was 40. And we ain't done shit with our lives. Huh? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> the fish doesn't even want to hear about it. <laughs> Oh my god! What a wild ride for thirty-four years of life, and it just gets wilder because, like, this story. Um, so he lives like to be like eighty-four. Like, he's so he's a, not even at the halfway point yet. Yeah, he's got a hell of a life ahead and of he's him. He's already given a monkey trauma from too many orgasms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just wait, what he to hear what it, I'm just waiting <laughs> to hear what he does with the dolphin. So. Um, it was on a trip in the late 1950s that Lily came across Marine Studios in Miami, which was the first place in the world to have a bottlenose dolphin born in captivity in 1947. Um, the dolphin had begun, uh, dolphins had begun to be added to aquariums in the beginning in the 1860s, but they were never properly studied in the 19th, 19th century or even in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, Marine Studios began doing research there. And that's when they first started having the ability to breed dolphins. But um, mainly, a lot of the reason why they didn't research on dolphins was that dolphins at the time were considered animal vermin, vermin because of the fact that dolphins competed with fishermen for fish. Um, they'd be known as herring hogs. Wow. I knew dolphins were assholes. But they're still assholes. Well, <laughs> it was in the tanks at Marine Studios that um, the dolphins' nature came out, and it was um, they were actually really surprised to learn that dolphins could begin to learn tricks, and it made them really hard to dislike them because they could do tricks and they had this really playful nature. So everybody really started to warm up the dolphins, and then that's how dolphins became so endeared to our culture, right? Yes. In yeah. about them. So for the first time, Lily had a chance to study the brain of the dolphin and began mapping their cerebral cortex using fine probes. I love it. He's just starting to fucking throw needles into the <laughs> dolphin brains now. He really does six hundred in a monkey study. He's just like, all right, needle. Well, he probed around so much that he accidentally asphyxiated several dolphins. <laughs> um, leading to the discovery that dolphins couldn't breathe unconsciously. Dolphins actually don't have, like, they don't, like, we breathe unconsciously. It's a natural reflex for us. Dolphins have to consciously breathe. They have to remind themselves to breathe. Interesting. So he hit the point of the and brain. And now we're all breathing manually. to make that decision. <laughs> so oh my. Lily took a little dolphin break. And uh, began to, like, explore the rat brains of rats, cats, sheep, and basically anything he could stick a needle into. Like, I'm sad that <laughs> didn't rhyme all the way. <laughs> How many um, needles can I fit in the head of each animal? So he also sought out whalers and... But, you know, for science. Yeah, yeah. all for science. <laughs> He uh, sought out whalers and sea captains who told him stories about dolphins who coordinated to tip over ships. I thought he was going to put the needles in there. Maybe that's how he got the story. I wonder how many orgasms I can give a captain of a fishing boat. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the stamina of your arm, buddy. Yeah, here you go. Yeah, here you go, Captain. Here's if you a... push this button, it'll give you an orgasm. I mean, if, if he's got the stamina to stab a monkey in the skull six hundred times, <laughs> I think he's going to be able to manage. He'd probably get that Captain a few orgasms. 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 Stop at it, post. It's okay. <laughs> oh wow! What do you think post is? Huh? <laughs> I don't think post is, but you think post is. It's post after. Post after will not be edited unless you say the editor's name. Yeah, you have to mention Sagar. If you have to tell Sagar, please edit that oh, out. Shit. <laughs> Why did it go quiet? Did it? You do realize we're on a show, right? <laughs> Dead air. Dead air. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So we sought out these whalers and sea captains not to stick needles in their brains, but to get stories about dolphins that coordinated to tip over ships or dolphins that. Uh, who had never seen a harpoon but seemed to avoid it as though they recognized it. Um, and this, to him, was evidence that they for sure spoke some sort of complex language. Um, 
he thought it was narcissism on the on humans' parts to not recognize the dolphins had a language. He even wrote, "We severely handicapped in our effort to measure the intelligence of individual other species than our own. We use inappropriate yardsticks derived from our own history as primates with hands and legs." Um, on one occasion in 1957, the research would even take him, like, would take him in a weird place. Um, he found he was operating on a dolphin, and the dolphin began to imitate his assistant, Ali, uh, Alice Miller. So, she, like, the dolphin even began to imitate this person. So, he thought dolphin's part to communicate with the human. So, he watched as this imitation was happening, and the dolphin's like basically like mimicking this other person, and then was like, Oh, they're trying to speak to us. <laughs> so oh they used it. My, <laughs> I, that's how I got caught in by Dalton. <laughs> <laughs> so they used an underwater microphone called a hydrophone to catalog the screeches, clicks, and vocalizations of dolphins, which he believed expressed more than just sexual desire or an alert for danger. Again, he writes, these observations led to the further study, uh, to further studies in which we demonstrated unequivocal, uh, equ equivocally. Yeah, Why is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Equivocally. Yeah. Sorry. We, I'm speaking French all afternoon. So that each dolphin has two communication emitters, both in the nose, i.e. below the bay, a blowhole, on each, one on each side, right and left phonation apparatus is demonstrated in the dolphin's nasal passage thus a dolphin can carry on a whistle conversation in his right side and a clicking conversation with his left side and do the two quite end up true they can have two different conversations happening the human equivalent is being able to talk to somebody verbally while having a sign language conversation yeah uh, i'm very familiar with this dalton was also talking to reginald at the exact same <laughs> time meanwhile we can barely speak english yeah, we barely. <laughs> I know, you've only known English no, since no, no. the century. Ha! <laughs> 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 huh. When we invented it, you don't get to be mad at him for that. You set that up. <laughs> Hello, happy toaster. <laughs> <laughs> happy toaster. All right, so around 1957, Lily also developed some ideas about extraterrestrials. And then this is also when someone would introduce him to LSD. Ivan Tors, who was the producer of the first Flipper movie released in 1963. And, we're, and then uh, this movie led into the TV series Flipper, which was a show that ran from 1964 to 1967. I actually used to watch that. Yeah. Dalton played Flipper. Okay, <laughs> to go into a sensory deprivation the belief that his oh. life was governed by extraterrestrial beings. Yeah, that's, that's fair. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> that <checks. laughs> that's fair. Well. So in the late 1950s, he started to believe in the existence that there was a certain high, um, hierarchical group of cosmic entities, and the lowest of which he later dubbed Earth Coincidence Control Office, or ECHO. He stated, there exists a Cosmic Coincidence Control Center, the CCCC, with a galactic substation of the Galactic, uh, galactic Coincidence Control, GCC. Within the GCC is the Solar System Control Unit, the SSCU, within which the Earth Coincidence Control Office, ECCO, or ECHO, like, I love that he has this all broken down, that there's like a huge structure of a government... <laughs> so, like, I love that the government uses so many acronyms to under, to you know explain itself. Yeah. So he also wrote that there are nine conditions that allow uh, that should be followed by people who see uh, alien contact in their lives. So here are the nine conditions. One, you must assume, simulate. Uh, you must uh, you must know slash assume slash simulate our existence in Echo. You must be willing to accept our um our responsibility for control of your coincidences so three also you, must... you need to do just all of the acid yeah. and be in a sensory deprivation chamber the whole time 
Yeah. So you must exert your best capabilities for your survival programs and your own development in uh, as an advancing slash advanced member of Echo's Earthside Corps of controlled coincidence workers. You are expected to use your best intelligence in this service. Four, you are expected to expect the unexpected every minute of every hour of every day and of every night. <laughs> I ah! love expected to expect the unexpected. No one suspects <laughs> the unexpected. That's the acid right there. <laughs> like, I, the Spanish Inquisition. Ah! Yep. Yep. I set it up for it. And I'm, Number five. Anyway. You must be able to maintain conscious slash thinking slash reason. You. That's Some a bullshit events. double standard. You need kind of conscious thought. <laughs> yeah. So some of these events will seem cataclysmic slash catastrophic, uh, ca- catastrophic slash overwhelming. Catastrophic. Catastrophic. Yeah. catastrophic. <laughs> uh, remember, it's only, it's only half the star. <laughs> I see. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't understand English. Not as well as fish. <laughs> no, we invented it. God. <laughs> so remember, stay aware no matter what happens, uh, slash apparently happens to you. <laughs> Number six, you are in our training program for life. There is no escape from it. We, not you, control the long-term coincidences. You, not we, control the short-term coincidences by your own efforts. Uh, I love the phrasing of that. You're in this for life. There's no escape from it. We control your long-term coincidences. You only control the short-term ones. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Nothing to add to that. Nope. Nothing. That's, that's dumb enough on its own. We don't need to... I don't know why that audio is so messed. <laughs> what was that? What was... Hey. Oh, sounds like your speaker came up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're using a laptop, so that's not <laughs> happening. Yeah, I don't think that's the speaker. <laughs> that's fair. You guys don't regularly go into your motherboards on laptops and unplug speakers. <laughs> amateur hour over here. That's the, amateur that's hour. Echo. <laughs> Believe it or not, we as fish know how to do that quite thoroughly. <laughs> I figured. Yeah. Uh, modern electricity go great we're all tech experts so we get youtube and and itunes all right (laughs) your major mission on earth is to discover slash create that which we do to control the long-term coincidence and patterns and you are being trained on earth to do this job eight when your mission on planet earth is completed you are no longer required to remain slash return there (laughs) You're in this for life, so when your mission is accomplished, you're no longer required. Is that a threat? <laughs> I need water. So I'm a fish. So remember the motto passed to us from the GCC via the SSCU: Cosmic love is absolutely ruthless and highly indifferent. It teaches its lesson whether you like slash dislike them or not. That's just like something my dad said one time. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, son, but in a very indifferent kind of way. Yeah, he definitely wasn't taking LSD when he said it. <laughs> I don't know, that's more or less fucked up, actually. <laughs> he didn't pop open the jet sensory deprivation chamber and be like, AJ. <laughs> Holy crud. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what are they putting on these stamps? So you believe that aliens were his guide and were steering him in a certain direction. So he's like, not got a pretty impressive life. Those aliens really like him. <laughs> like, uh, he would call Echo one of God's field offices. They control our lives, even though we won't admit it. <laughs> In 1958, these cosmic beings convinced Lily to abandon the results, uh, the results-oriented constraints of the government-funded research, divorce his wife, and just basically take over researching dolphins. <laughs> I love it. I love the idea that he's just like the aliens. To- like I just picture him going in, 
<laughs> to his job being like, I'm not studying anything for the government anymore. They go in to see his wife. We're getting a divorce. I have to go and research the dolphins because the aliens told me so. <laughs> <laughs> How do I get out of everything I've committed to? <laughs> you know, Dalton tried enough. that trick on us once, but it didn't go over well. We don't believe in aliens. Oh my god. This is a very impressive midlife crisis this guy's having. <laughs> right. So he studied the dolphins for three years, and in 1961, after one really highly amphetamine fueled weekend. Surprise. Because you know, of course he's taking <laughs> he, he woke produced, up next to the dolphin. Uh, this book was uh this w- book claimed that dolphins displayed complex emotions and were capable of controlling anger. Um and that they, like humans, often trembled at the response of being hurt. Or, you know, you know, that's a normal response when you're being hurt. Like, yeah, most creatures that, you know, feel pain tend to shake, sh- you know, <laughs> veer away from it. Except humans. Humans have a weird need for pain sometimes. I believe that we don't kink shame here. Massive. We don't kink shame. <laughs> it's funny because that's one of our quotes. That, well, <laughs> That is, in fact, one of our taglines. Yep. Along with Wes and shut up! <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> You're not Wes. <laughs> I I know, but you said it at me. It felt like it was directed. <laughs> you need to understand English a little better. <laughs> I understand it perfectly well. I was there when we invented it in the 18th century. Yeah. So, um... They are here very long living fish in this book that they are our uh, that dolphins are our cognitive equals telepathy that is the key to understanding extraterrestri- extraterrestrial communication. So this is actually from the book. Um yeah, uh Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? No, no. That's it. Thanks for all the fish. Yeah, thanks for all the fish. <laughs> <laughs> and then they all bail. <laughs> so within the next decade or two, human species will establish communication with another species, non-human, alien, possibly extraterrestrial. And more probably marine, but definitely highly intelligent, perhaps even intellectual. I love the idea. Highly intelligent, perhaps even intellectual. Like, <laughs> okay. These dolphins also have a degree in philosophy. <laughs> An optimistic prediction, I admit. In this book, I have summarized the basic reasons for my beliefs and presented some evidence in the validity of the prediction. In a way, this is a crude elementary handbook for those humans who are interested in the realization of such communication. If no one among us pursues the matter before interspecies communication is forced upon homo sapiens by an alien species, this book will have failed in its purpose. But if this account sparks public and private interest in time for us to make some preparations before we encounter such beings, I shall feel my time was well spent in research in the research here described. Essentially, whole whack of dolphins killed a bunch of them and i think there's aliens trying to talk to us but we need to prepare for that <laughs> i believe i read a book about this once uh was it called man and dolphin no <laughs> no it was called fear and loathing in las vegas <laughs> fair <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good book in the sea um, so have you guys actually looked up this book at all no because i f- i feel like most of these reviews don't know What's the words? The very eclectic lifestyle of John C. Lilly in the way well, that they're crazy. I have to agree with that because of the fact that everywhere that I read, they're like it captured public's imagination and the book became a bestseller. So I have to assume that there was a lot of people being like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> just Yes. <laughs> yeah. so, like, sometimes I hear about these books that get written by people that are just absolutely insane and be like, how did you guys come to agree to this? Like, who read this and thought, huh, that makes sense. Like, <laughs> and all I can ever think is, okay, so he was really, he was, and obviously he wrote this book after a meth-fueled weekend, are you also all high on acid and meth? <laughs> like, I mean, no offense to yes. anybody that likes this book, but 
or <laughs> acid or meth. <laughs> okay, love the faces are covered. My I hometown. haven't looked up the reviews recently for it. <laughs> My hometown has a really bad meth problem. I'm, I'm trying. I like how you said that with such an upbeat attitude. <laughs> an upbeat there's, there's hope there. Your your fish hometown has a problem with meth. Yeah, on Clipperton yes. Island. On Clipperton Island. You really should look Clipperton up Clipperton Island. Island. Or just watch the episode. Yeah, we have show. a whole episode on Clipperton Island. You know, I think people should listen to our show more often. Yes. Where could we find this show if we wanted to listen to it? Oh, I'm glad you asked. It's on. <laughs> 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 well done <laughs> I got you fishy I got you <laughs> well played well played <laughs> I'm proud of you <laughs> and if you look it up on YouTube it's all those yeah. things <laughs> don't even story no no we're not done yet oh okay it's gonna be worse. we haven't gotten to well, the dolphins Lily also, yeah so Lily also believed that we that dolphins could quote, teach us to live in outer space without gravity, end quote. He proposed that they could be trained, they could uh, be trained to serve the Navy. Like, he's just coming up with all these ideas, all for dolphins. Didn't didn't the Navy actually use dolphins? Yeah, for, for certain espionage missions and stuff. Oh, so something worked. Um, I noted astronomer Frank Drake also read Lily's book and drew parallels between his own work and Lily's. So there was another guy being like, this is fucking so similar to my stuff. Um, so we had Space it, dolphins, we, of we course. We the same supplier, all right? <laughs> it turns out all of them were just reading Douglas Adams. <laughs> <laughs> so Drake headed to the National Radio Astronomy Observation, uh, Green Banks Telescope in West Virginia. Holy crud, is that ever a title? Uh, he read Man and Dolphin between doing observational research. Okay, so he's reading this. So then he spearheaded Project Ozma waves emitted from other planets. <laughs> planets. 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 <laughs> Not to be confused with planets. <laughs> oh, that's what they were gonna downgrade Pluto to. <laughs> you know, we've we've gone down from nine planets to eight planets and a planet. <laughs> <laughs> so, um. So far, Drake's uh, search has turned up nothing. Um, so he needed a no. way to find his re- his search, and he needed a way to communicate with whatever was out there once he found it. So he invited Dr. Lilly to a meeting at the observatory in West Virginia, and he even... I really thought you were going to say he invited a dolphin. <laughs> he invited a dolphin there. <laughs> well, he also brought Carl Sagan to this meeting. So he's... Carl Sagan's a whole story on his own. <laughs> so this meeting led to the Drake equation, which is the formula de- that is used to determine um, the likelihood of a planet being home to alien life. Um, but there were still a lot of questions and how they would communicate with the aliens, which led back to Dr. Lilly, who proposed that dolphins would be able to communicate with the aliens. Yes, Stretch the circumstance. So all these scientists, Carl Sagan included, banded around Lily's idea and even made pins featuring dolphins that they all wore on their jackets. And they became called the Order of the Dolphins and sent each other little coded messages to decipher. It was really the worst Harry Potter book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rowling really went off hill after the controversy. Yeah. <laughs> uh... So these uh, codes were half for fun and half to test their abilities to communicate in an unfamiliar language. Like, we got to figure out how to communicate in languages we don't understand so that we could be like the dolphins. <laughs> so, what a fun sentence that was. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, Asta decides to get behind Lily's idea and the order of the dolphins here, and Lily gets a bunch of NASA money and begins to set up a lab at St. Thomas, one of the US, uh, U.S. Virgin Islands. So, um, back in the 60s, even though the U.S. Virgin Islands are very, like, they're much more like, I've never been there. So, but back then it was. AJ has. Have, now they're just there. Yeah, I've never been there, so I don't know. <laughs> have either of you been there? I haven't been there. Do you haven't swam over there? Yeah, you never swam over there. Absolutely. He's on the other not. side. 
<laughs> do, do you know how long that would take? I'm not a land dwelling fish like the fucking dolphins. He lives in the forest for Christ's sake. (laughs) 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 All right. So Lily hoped that St. Thomas would be the place where he can launch his water house, (laughs) dolphin human hybrid living space. So he built the model that he thought would be perfect for humans and dolphins to cohabitate in. Ah, yes. Giant (laughs) beings of the sea. Let's trap them in a small area. (laughs) Yeah. So he built a laboratory housing a workspace on the upper level. Did anyone else just picture a sea, like a giant fish bowl with a castle in it, and it's like a sea monkey aquarium? (laughs) Dolphins doing flips and shit. (laughs) So Lily built a enclosure on the bottom and tucked away on a picturesque shore of the Caribbean. He called the Alabaster Building Dolphin Point. So this is where we're getting to the Dolphin Point experiment. That's the name of the episode. <laughs> yeah. Um, How apropos. He was able to get three dolphins from Marine Studios, and Carl Sagan would even visit and go scuba diving with the dolphins. I love that Carl Sagan still linked in this. I know. When does he join the cast of <laughs> Family <laughs> Full House? Full House. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so, I'm going to go. Um, <laughs> those three dolphins were named Pamela, Sissy, and Peter. And of course, they, had, they each had their own unique personalities. Of course. Um, they were described as there were three dolphins, Peter, Pamela, and Sissy. Sissy was the biggest, pushy, loud. She sort of ran the show. Pamela, who was very shy, very, uh, shy and fearful. And Peter, who was a young guy, he was sexually coming of age and a bit naughty. We're going to, um, the person who described this, we're going to be introducing her very soon. And there's a very terrible. Well, I am so happen. glad that that description of a dolphin was said in your voice <laughs> on a recording. Just so we're clear. He was very naughty. <laughs> very pleased with this. He was very naughty. So, <laughs> the person who described these dolphins was Margaret Ho, who was Lily's assistant. And we're going to meet her now. Uh, Margaret Ho Lovett. Oh, hi, Margaret. Oh, what's up? <laughs> Margaret was born in St. Thomas in 1942, so she grew up here on the island. Um, Around Christmas 1963, when Margaret was 23, her brother-in-law mentioned that there was a secret lab being uh, near where she lived on the eastern end of the island where they were working with dolphins. So um, the island is 13 miles long. So basically everything is in close proximity to you. So Mary loved animals and dolphins were among her favorite animals. So she decided to pay the lab a visit and she drove out there, went down a muddy hill, saw a building from the cliff side of the cliff, and not knowing what was going on there, she decided that she was going to basically just approach this entire thing. Um, <clears throat> Mary had been obsessed with the concept of talking to animals since she was a kid. So when she met John Lilly, he gave her the he basically told her what they were doing, and she was like, I'm totally <laughs> red flag number one. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, God. So, anyways, um, growing up, I love cartoons that were talking animals, which is a normal kid thing. Like, she wanted uh, to witness uh, the breakthrough that would make a reality, so she wanted to help. And at the lab, she kept showing up unannounced, and she met the director... Gregory Bateson and Bateson asked her what she was doing there and she said well I heard you had dolphins now if I'm correct she sounds like the early early version of what we call nowadays a furry oh god I don't think so <laughs> I I have strong feelings about this okay so <laughs> she said, okay what we got she's like she said, well, I heard you had dolphins, and I thought I'd come and see if there was anything I could do. So Bateson, um, who liked that Margaret just showed this, like, boldness, decided that he was going to hire her on, and she basically became the assistant. Even with no degrees or any 
back. Both Bateson and Lily realized that she had some intuitiveness and offered her an open invitation to the lab. They also realized that there wasn't a high demand for competent free dolphin interns. So they were just going to take the free labor where it was. Um, Mm -hmm. And so Lily did not uh, actually did think that Margaret's sudden appearance was proof of echo in action. Yeah, of course. So he's like the alien center here. You know, of course I have to take you. The alien center. Coincidence that there's a video game called Echo the Dolphin. It's spelled differently though. (laughs) But I is it though? It is. (laughs) But uh wait, wait, wait. How do you spell echo? E C C O? Yeah, E C C O. It is not spelled differently. No. (laughs) Echo the dolphin? Echo the Dolphin, ECCO the Dolphin, a video oh game. Oh, God. That's why I said, is it, several <laughs> times? <laughs> Anyways, she worked with the dolphins, um, and through daily lessons, she encouraged them to create human-esque sounds. She also began to fall in love with them, and she began to see them as her friends. And she started to feel guilty about leaving them on the lo- oh, alone no. in the lab overnight, oh, so no. the upper rooms, and flooding them for a couple feet. This way, human and dolphin could occupy the same space, same space. I love the idea that she was like, I feel bad leaving them alone, so how about we just flood the upper level and I'll sleep with the dolphins? Like, Oh, no. No way this could backfire. She did. So this way she sinking spend, feeling in my stomach. This way she could spend 24 hours a day with her dolphin buddies, build some rapport, and basically become a family to them. Um, she felt it would continually build a connection with them and it would make it easier for their progress to be made and it make it easier for her to keep teaching them because she's not going away. It's not like, well, lessons over, we're all done for the day. Um, so suddenly uh, they did have some kind of like a breakthrough. Um, they were learning certain things about human language, but I don't think it was as far as she was going. But she did really, really make some progress with Peter. Um, yep. The two would coexist in the lab six days a week for almost an entire summer. And every seventh day, Peter would spend time being connected to his doll, like to the other dolphins. But um, Margaret started spending a lot of one on one time with young Peter, and she quickly realized that Peter saw her as more than a friend. Uh, Quote, We had nothing to do. uh, We had nothing to do was when we did the most. He was very, very interested in my anatomy. No. No. If I was here and my legs were in the water, he would come up and look, uh, come up and look back, look at the back of my knee for a long time. He wanted to know how that thing worked, and I was so charmed by it. So then, because he's a coming of age, like coming of yeah. sexual maturity dolphin, uh, he also found her extremely attractive. Yeah. <laughs> so Peter would start to rub himself against her body. And after a few dry humping sessions, Margaret decided um, that she needed to satisfy him manually. Oh, oh good. Here's my toaster. This, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. this is very similar to the story with Dalton. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so, quote, it was just easier to incorporate I'm like an itch. Just get rid of that scratch it was, perhaps. It seems to me that it made the bond closer, not because of the sexual activity, but because of the lack of having to breaking. That's really all it was. I was there to get to know Peter, and that part, w- uh, and that was part of Peter. Oh my God! I mean, she's not wrong. It, it is part of Peter. Peter's Peter. Um, <laughs> Peter's Peter. <laughs> so Peter's- why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why not? Haven't you slept with the dolphin? I have. Oh God! But well, you're a fish, so I don't know what that has to do with anything. I thought we weren't being racist on this podcast anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you say anymore? Yeah, we used to have a guy. <laughs> 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 to be fair, he was the most racist one. <laughs> uh. So, to get back to this, um, the program... Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to come back from that. Yeah, so... Wasn't uh, hard. Away from her 
ev- like her desires with Dolphin Point <laughs> here. And, uh, <laughs> with Dolphin Point, yeah. <laughs> so, again, they hired her without any scientific training, and now she's basically sleeping with the dolphins. Uh, Margaret felt regret when people would begin to, like, pack up and leave every day because of this. Again, she approached the whole thing. She is pretty well living with Peter. Like, this is a full-blown relationship happening here. Oh, God. Um, Dr. Lily, of course, shared sentiments that Margaret wrote about because Margaret would keep, a re- like, would write reports about these things. Like, the sexual things. So, like, quote, why, why, why must there be a dominance and subordination? Why must man take over and why must apes, uh, why must the apes take over? <laughs> so... This is based around the Planet of the Apes when she um, was asked about it. She literally is just like as lost as he is in this. Uh, So Margaret slept usually in in her daytime clothes, wet and in the bed that was wet and with a dry quilt laid on here. Like she's living... Oh God. Um, So because of the fact that the other two were female they kind of like didn't have as much interest. And I feel that's where, that's why she worked so closely with Peter because he had so much interest in her. Of course he did. Um, Peter was a simp. Quote, I chose to work with Peter because he had not had any human-like sound training and the other two had, which I feel is like an excuse on her part. Like, oh, they kind of had human-like sound training. So I wanted to go from scratch without a science degree or any background in science. Yep, that's how it works. Yeah. So I guess it's, it's hard to just come out and say that she wanted wit or dolphin dick. Basically. But. So um, Margaret began to have second thoughts, lying in bed surrounded by the water that on the first night of her being in there and listening to the pumps gurgling away, she wrote, uh, quote, Human people were out there having dinner and whatever, uh, or whatever, and I am here. There's moonlight reflecting on the water, this uh, fin and this bright eye looking at me, looking at you, and I thought, wow, why am I here? (laughs) But then you get back into it, and there was trying to find out what Peter was doing there and what we could do together. (laughs) Nobody had done it. Uh, That's some activities you can do together. Yeah. So, Margaret... So this is in the first week. Margaret settled into um, the experiment and found that Peter was eager to communicate. Of course he fucking is. He responded enthusiastically to the lessons. And uh, Margaret... Uh, Yeah, bet he did. uh, Margaret really thought that they were making progress. The schedule went a little bit like this. Um, Margaret gets up at, at 7.30, washes and eats. And then from 8 to 8.30, there's uh, recorded lessons with Peter... And five pounds of fish. 9 a.m., Margaret does some daily cleaning. 9.30, she does some feeding, notes, and checks on, like, all the people around her, and workmen, and so on. 10 to 10.30, um, Margaret and Peter play. And then at 11... (laughs) It says play. And then at 11, they go outside and relax. I believe the term you're looking for is fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so at 11.30, she gets lunch. And then from 12 to 12.30, there's recorded lessons with Peter and another five pounds of fish. 1 to 2.30, um, Margaret goes to sleep. Uh, right, there's another recorded lesson and five pounds of fish with Peter. <laughs> 4 to 4.30, more time spent working on Peter. So are we talking about, like, actual fish, or is this code? Uh, this is fish. Is that, is okay, that, okay. That <laughs> make sure. your time. I also uh, like that you emphasize it's that it's for Peter, because <laughs> yeah. at this I point, it would just be like, this woman's like, eating 20 pounds of fish a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he eats them like chips. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, 6 so o'clock, she has dinner, and then 6.30, games with Peter, visitors, reading, um, and maintaining awareness of living with peter uh end of the day work is over and they're still together and at 10 o'clock she goes to bed and she would basically do this every day in their lessons margaret avoided using colors 
as it wasn't known if dolphins could see colors. The same I thought you were going to say condoms. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so your boy is using condoms. <laughs> So Margaret only acknowledged Peter's humanoid response. I did not respond to his attention getting whistles or cl- a lot of women do not respond to clicks or whistles. <laughs> she like being cat called. Okay, that's fair. This is why I'm into dolphins. <laughs> uh, quote, and then another quote, uh, she, uh, sorry, in one of the recordings, she actually speaks to Peter and says, come right out with the English, Peter. Don't even think in your own language, English all the time. She wrote, my first goal will be to get him to pronounce any word clearly and know the meaning. This will probably be at a time uh, be a time coming and is the hardest step. What I love is she's yelling at a dolphin in this recording, being like, just speak English already. <laughs> yeah, that's not unhinged uh, at all. <laughs> and the first words of the Science. dolphin were, what a fuck? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Karen yelling at a migrant. <laughs> so um john Lilly, who is one of the main people running this experiment did not interfere with the experiment at all but he did not get involved in this is anybody surprised though? Not. like <laughs> right he spent most of his time and most of the nasa money doing acid while sequestered <laughs> in- that bullshit right like Margaret, you're fucking dolphins come on <laughs> yeah <laughs> 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 Why? Uh, his reasoning was that he spent the time there floating in the dark trying to communicate telepathically with the aliens he hoped would provide him the correct answers to any problems and setbacks that plagued his research. So he just like, things aren't going accordingly. Aliens, please help me. And the whole point of this experiment is that you know humans can't communicate with the aliens, so that's why we need the fucking dolphins to do it. <laughs> Man, drugs are a powerful thing, all right? Yeah. <laughs> like, Jesus. So, end of June, by the end of the first month, Peter seemed to uh, be making progress. He was voc- uh, he was vocalizing out of the water more often than not. So he's coming out of the water to speak, like, to make these sounds. Um, quote, he responds with a good 95% humanoid, only occasionally Delphinese comments on the side. Delphinese. 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 <laughs> Not dolphinese, delphinese. I love that they have made a language for the dolphin language. It's Super Mario with the sunshine. Or lips to speak human language. <laughs> yeah. So, um, quote, he has been practicing with the pronunciation of the letter M from Margaret, no doubt, and is discovering that rolling slightly so that his blowhole is just under the water gives a satisfactory M effect. Pam has done exactly the same thing. So she's happy that he's making these mimicking sounds. I have a feeling that he's just learned that that sound gets him attention. Yeah. So wait, were we not on the same page there? Yeah, so she's also very concerned. No, we've all tried to block that out of our memory. (laughs) Um, The more time they spent together, Peter was having more and more trouble focusing. He was (laughs) hyper wanted to play. He'd tangle himself up in Margaret's lay, uh, le- in <laughs> Margaret's legs, yeah, ladies, and giving her bruises and bites. Is that is that a metaphor or is like actual tangled up in her legs? Like he would definitely he would like try to like trip her up to get her into the water. Oh, to um, okay. She wrote, "Quote: I look forward to the days when Peter will yell at me rather than nip me and uh, nip at me to show me his displeasure." Um, it was also sh- very clear that he's going through puberty. Yeah, I think that's very fucking clear. Um, quote, I find that his desires are hindering our relationship. I can play with him for just so long. Now. So the solution is that at first she decided that she was going to give Peter several day-long periods throughout the week in the tank with Pam and Sissy, and that wasn't working. So then she had a different idea, and it was, quote, another thought I had on the subject is whether or not it would be best to, for the human to somehow find a way to satisfy the dolphin's sexual needs with another dolph- uh, without another dolphin. This may strengthen the bond between dolphin and the human. I have an idea. Let's give a dolphin a hand job. So, <laughs> I'm so glad that's recorded in Wally's voice. <laughs> <laughs> Just make a little sound bite. <laughs> so, 
So this isn't the first time that humans have tried to have sex with animals, and we'll come back to that in a little while. Do we have to? <laughs> yes, yes, we do. Fair. Reality, yeah, or which is spelled B E S T because it's the bestiality. No, no. The bestiality. Why are you actually a dolphin in disguise as a fish? <laughs> no, I'm a fucking fish. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I so oh, I don't swear this much. That I'm was such a good well time. Played, so, <laughs> so, yep. Um, Margaret is still alive currently, and she actually no. stated that none of this was sexual attraction for her. Um, she said that their sexual summer together was quote, um, it was very precious, it was very gentle, it was sexual on his part, it was not sexual on mine, sensual perhaps. So sensual again. Here we go again. Um, she put in her diary, quote, I found that by taking his penis in my hand and letting oh. him <laughs> himself against me, he would reach some sort of <laughs> orgasm, mouth open, eyes closed, body shaking, and then his penis would relax and would draw. He would repeat this maybe two or three times, and then his erection would stop and he'd seem satisfied. So Margaret was a butt, basically. He basically. just did the same experiment with a yeah. human lady instead of a butt. Um, now that it happened that Peter has modified his sexual rambunctiousness and to a more humanized level and no longer has to come to a dead stop when he gets excited. Is there a, is there a reason you had us pause after the word come? <laughs> <laughs> this is uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> you chose this topic. <laughs> this is on you. <laughs> So uh, Peter's sexual excitement usually begins with the biting business. Am I stroking him? Now, however, when his, uh, when his penis becomes erect, he no longer tries to run me down or knock me off my feet. Rather, he slides very smoothly along my legs. I could very easily rub his penis with, my, with either my hand or my foot. <laughs> She's giving him foot jobs, too. <laughs> Peter accepts either and again seems to reach for some sort of orgasm and relaxes. We usually go through this three or four times before he quits and starts another game. It's... Holy fuck. <laughs> oh. uh. So at the end of July 1965, um, we're nearing the end of the experiment and she was no closer to conversing to Peter than when they had started. Quote, several times during the period, I felt physically depressing effects of the situation to the point where I found myself actually crying. Small inconveniences suddenly loomed as a very large and uh, as very large and ugly. And I would find myself in a fit of self-pity and depression. It was Peter who brought me out of it every single time without exception. No. No. This is not a thing you just said. <laughs> this is what happens when you start to sleep with dolphins. <laughs> um... <laughs> So her, I, I know a thing or two. They are pretty clingy. <laughs> so her sexual interactions with Peter became increasingly normal to her. Um, quote, I started out afraid of Peter's mouth and afraid of Peter's sex. It has taken Peter about two months to teach me and two months for me to learn that I am free to involve myself completely with both. Oh. <sighs> yeah, yeah, I'll be. I, um, that's a lot of back. She's not even doing this when they're just alone. Quote, is not, this is not a private thing. Peter and I have done it with other people present, but it is very precious sort of thing. Peter is completely involved, and I involve myself to the extent of putting as much love into the tone, touch, and mood as possible. We do not have to respect his privacy, but we cannot help, uh, we do not have to respect his privacy, but we cannot help but respect his happiness. She's doing this in front of people. Like, this is all part of a study. <laughs> Wait, you haven't? Oh. I have. I've never had sex with a dolphin in front of Jesus. That's in front of it people. Be with a dolphin. So, what you're saying uh, is you have had sex with a dolphin, though. That's what I'm saying. That's what I heard. That sentence. <laughs> yeah, okay. As long as we're on the same page. <laughs> heard Ben had sex with a dolphin. He just refuses to do it in front of people. Yeah. Because Ben has stage fright. <laughs> Well, that wasn't my question. Standards, I'm glad we came right. to some sort of conclusion. Uh, so this entire thing became public knowledge. Um, when the 10 weeks were over, Dr. Lilly, Margaret and Dr. Lilly had originally planned to resume the experiment for a long time because they actually like 
pause this for 10 weeks. But Lily found um, himself struggling to figure out how to make this a reality. Uh, he had been relying on financial backers, namely Lassa, uh, NASA, Lassa, NASA. <laughs> <laughs> But without results proving the experiment was success, the funding was getting cut. So, like, they were just being like, no, like, you're not accomplishing anything. We can't just keep doing this. Like, the only thing I'm going to keep paying you to jerk off dolphins. dolphins. (laughs) (laughs) Damn it. So, this is an amazing scheme, though. They got NASA to pay this lady to jerk off dolphins. Like, not academic and scientific community are also starting to criticize him. Uh, quote, if Good. Uh, imagine three said it was very poor intelligibility by a dolphin is indicative of the giant brained mam- animal's ability to speak and therefore to learn language. What is to be said of a parrot's clear cut if bird brained Polly wants a cracker? Furthermore, if the parrot is then given a cracker, have we established communication with an alien species? That's what one of these people wrote about him. So basically, they're being like, if the parrot understands that by saying Polly wants a cracker, gets them a cracker, is that contact with a completely different species? Like, are we talking to an alien? Like, uh, kind of like one of the questions I had in the beginning. Like, isn't that still communication? Like, I just know that saying these well, that words was, in this order will generate a response from you, right? Like, yeah, that but it wouldn't be called. That wouldn't be. Con, can, that wouldn't be communication with an alien. Oh, that was an alien. Because yeah. that bird would probably have to be from another country or from outer space. This is what I've learned how <laughs> aliens are. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. I, that, his criticism is really taking a toll on his personality. So he decides that he needs to. As one out. does. <laughs> Lily, yeah, Lily began giving it to the uh, to two of the dolphins as well. <laughs> to <the 50>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, just when you think this can't get funny. more bat shit. I love it. I love that he is being like, I need more acid, and obviously the dolphins need acid. <laughs> Look at <laughs> the fuck, Peter. Me, yeah. Bam, and Sissy are going to have Peter's goddamn really got party. got his own shit happening. Like, <laughs> so, quote, as the... This is how we will communicate with the aliens. We're all, I'm going to drop some acid. We're going to give some acid to the dolphins. She's going to give him a hand job. It's all going to work out. <laughs> How could the aliens? Want, how could the aliens not want to talk to us? <laughs> Science. <laughs> so as the LSD effect came on, forty minutes after the injection of a hundred uh, milligrams. Holy shit! <laughs> sorry, a hundred micrograms, not milligrams. Holy okay. Shit. okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're fucking up this dolphin. Definitely. Daily. <laughs> oh, no. After the injection of the dolphin came over to me. She had not approached me before. She stayed still in the tank with one eye out of the water, looking up at me in the eye for 10 minutes without moving. This was completely <laughs> new behavior. I moved around to see if it would have any effect, uh, if there would be any effect from my movement. She followed me right around the edge of the tank. I moved out of the room, and the assistant moved into position. The same behavior continued. It is a very amazing change in behavior. She will now come within five feet of me instead of staying 20 feet away. Yeah, no shit. You she's trying to figure out what the fuck you did to her. She is fucked right now. She was like, what is happening? Only one you give me the, what is this kaleidoscope woman? You give so, me enough alcohol, I'm going to pet a fucking bear. Like, yeah. duh. So because this 100 micrograms was so effective on the other two dolphins even though margaret protested it dr lily gave peter 200 micrograms and recorded his reactions um whatever the effect the lsd had on peter though it seemed to be entirely uh, by the end of the summer largely over injecting dolphins with lsd most of the staff resigns like, so not fucking dolphins. <laughs> fucking dolphins is okay, but drugs is where he draws the line. Yeah. You're one, not giving them drugs. <laughs> a hand one, job was one thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of on the fence about the foot job. <laughs> in hand her job's defense, fine because we don't kick shame, but drugs? In her defense... I'm just imagining a dare program natural. starting up. <laughs> it was all natural? Is that what you yeah. said? 
apparently. <laughs> oh. I should have said no. A dare <laughs> resource officer shows up at the research facility. <laughs> and they teach the dolphins to say no. So now, Dr. Lilly has no funding from NASA or any of his other financial backers. And he has almost no support except for Margaret. Um, for the next few weeks, they would keep trying to figure out how to make Dolphin Point Lab sustain itself. And while Lily privately got more and more obsessed with LSD, sensory dep- deprivation, and the aliens, of course, he's just like, I'm super depressed. I'm going to go in my tank and drop. I got to consult depressed, the aliens. Do drugs about it. <laughs> and while to be Mark fair, though, like, tank- that's kind of normal human thinking. Yeah, and so while and so while he's doing that, Margaret is of course continuing her relationship with Peter. So by the autumn of 1966, um, Dr. Lilly's interest in speaking uh, in the speaking dolphin experiment is going away, and the lab's director Gregory Bateson quits as well. He's gone now. So Margaret gets a new job of decommissioning the lab, and she prepares to shift the dolphins away from uh, away to one of Dr. Lilly's other labs, which is a disused bank building in Miami. So he took a bank and made it into another lab. Like, um, it was a, like, and it wasn't as, but this wasn't as free as the Dolphin House. Like, they're being shipped to Miami, but they're inside of a bank building where this is actually, like, a connected to the ocean kind of Mm. house. So um, at the Miami lab, um, they're held in smaller tanks. There's no sunlight. Um, and Peter actually deteriorates quickly. And after a few weeks, um, Dr. Lilly calls Margaret to tell him uh, to tell her that Peter had committed suicide. This whole research what? is actually they're not automatic readers. When they're very depressed, and they actually will do this, and there's a lot of sources that show this, they will swim to the bottom of the tank and just refuse to breathe again until they're dead. Oh my! And that's broke up, broken up with, and killed himself. Yeah. Um, Whoa! I I gotta say, that's a twist I didn't see coming. Yeah, like crazy, eh? Um, This story's got everything. (laughs) It's actually crazy because Kathy, who was uh, one of the dolphins that played Flipper in the old TV series, actually did the same thing after filming wrapped up because she just felt like all of a sudden she wasn't as important anymore and they're not paying as much attention to her anymore and they're not stimulating her as more but they're keeping her captive so she killed herself um richard o'berry the man who captured and trained the dolphins for flipper um he actually fell into a lifetime of guilt and later was arrested for trying to free other dolphins so he actually was shaken up by the fact that he would train these dolphins after capturing them and then realize that they get depressed and kill them and after dr lily has left and she Married the photographer who captured the pictures of the experiment, John Lovett. <laughs> That's not where I thought that was going. <laughs> um, not that John Lovett, but okay. Um, <laughs> this guy took pictures of her having sex with the dolphin and then was like, you know what? That's the girl I want to marry. That's wife material right there. Yeah. Kink unlocked. She, if she can satisfy a dolphin... Um, so they actually moved back into the dolphin house and eventually converted into a family home where they brought up three daughters. <laughs> all dolphins. All dolphins. No, <laughs> um, no, 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 no. I'm not okay with this. <laughs> so, quote, over the years I received letters from people who are working with the uh, dolphins themselves. They often say things like, when I was seven, I read about you living with a dolphin and that's what started it for me. No. <laughs> I read about you living with a dolphin. Oh, did you read about me fucking him too? Like, no. <laughs> so, Dr. John Lilly in 1968 published Programming and Metaprogramming for the, um, in the Human Bio Computer. And both books are about how he'd taken LSD and swam with the dolphins or locked himself in a deprivation tank. <laughs> Um, he described the, uh, his first time using LSD in an isolation tank and said that I traveled, um, I traveled through my brain watching the neurons and their activity. <sighs> um, he also write in the province of the mind, what one believes to be true 
either is true or becomes true within certain limits. These limits are to be found experimentally and experientially. <laughs> when so found, these limits turn out to be further beliefs to be transcended. In the province of the mind, there are no limits. However, in the province of the body, there are, uh, there are defined limits not to be transcended. So basically, I can do whatever the fuck I want in my mind, but my body obviously can because, you know, that's reality. Like, And this man clearly did yeah. not want to be part of reality Yeah, as a woman was giving a hand job to a dolphin. In 1978, he publishes his own autobiography, which um, is described as something called uh, the solid state intelligence. Um, he basically in it talks about networks of electronics engineered by humans will eventually develop into an autonomous bioform. So eventually we're all going to exist as one form in a low temperature vacuum. And that's what's going to happen to us is we're all just going to be nothing but human and technology together. The singularity? Yeah. Oh so my God. The matrix? Yeah. Um, so, in 1978, Hustler approaches Margaret and Dr. Lilly Imagine. To, to talk about Margaret and Peter's relationship for their November issue. Um, it's titled Interspecies Sex, Human and Dolphins. And it is basically softcore porn. Like... Only softball. Yeah. Um, there's a ton of quotes from Dr. Lilly in it. Um, and then he died at the age of 86 in 2001. And he never said that what they printed wasn't what he said. So he gives a bunch of quotes and then is like, people were like, that's too crazy. But he never denied that these were the quotes. Like, <laughs> um, yeah. So he ended up living in Los Angeles and Malibu until 1982, and then he moved to Hawaii Island of Maui and then continued his research on dolphins and whales in the wild. Well, luckily, he's not doing that. And he died of heart failure in Los Angeles on September 30th, 2001, and then his remains were cremated. So that's the dolphin point experiment. And I'm not going to go back on the whole sex thing with animals because I'm a little done with that. <laughs> Well, and not my kink, unfortunately. That makes one of us. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, hey. It looks like it looks like JOSC cord and Reginald are back. Oh, God. Uh, hey, guys. How's it going? Uh, <laughs> hey, Frederick. Thanks for taking over. Uh, no, no problem. Reginald. Frederick. God. How are you? Ah, uh, hey guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, also, uh, we we so we got your friend there, uh, Frederick. Hi, how's it going? Uh, it's me, Dalton. <laughs> uh, you want uh, you want to have some fun? Oh yes, yes indeed. Come on, Reginald. Come, Dalton. <laughs> Yes, let us uh, let us go. I don't know what that's about. Uh, so, yeah, what was... Uh, what happened with today's episode? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> well, what was it about? Just, you know, an island. <laughs> an island? Yeah, like Clipperton. <laughs> oh, okay. Jeez. Well, good thing I wasn't here. Uh, I just had this whole thing about hating on dolphins and how they're rapists. God, I... I I I just wouldn't have gotten over that. Um, don't don't tell Dalton. He seems like an all right guy, I guess. Um, he was it was weird. He was talking to me and Reginald at the same time, as if his brain could split up and communicate with two people at once. It was really fucking weird. I I feel like this episode's going in my repressed trauma folder. Um. Yeah. But anyway, uh, is that the is that the end of the episode? Yeah, I'm also going to put this episode in AJ's repressed trauma folder. <laughs> I'm not holding on to any of this. <laughs> oh, hey guys, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm Jay Wes. I'd, I'd rather the switch trauma. <laughs> <stuff. laughs> 
I, I, what is happening? Nothing, nothing at all. <laughs> Don't worry about it. All right, all right. I guess I'll close this episode. Thank you for joining us. As always, you can uh, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at BA Chaos Jar. You can also follow me on Twitter at I'm Glad You Asked underscore. It's kind of like a little ellipses. And, uh, you know, ask me any random question. That'd be fun. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook at Chaos Jar Podcast, which is also the name of our YouTube channel for those who aren't as podcast savvy. Uh, and, you know, uh, we'd appreciate if you'd uh, donate to our Patreon at patreon.com slash chaos jar. Uh, give us a couple of bucks and we'll uh, we'll give you a couple of uh, bonus rewards here and there. All right. Uh, don't forget to rate, review, uh, subscribe, comment, uh, hit the notification bell, wh- you know, whatever they do on YouTube. All right. And that's our show. So uh, have a good night. I can't believe that I spent two hours doing that.